Good afternoon. I'm Major Keith Carble, and on behalf of the officers, staff members, and cadets of the Freedom Battalion, welcome to the joint uh, commissioning ceremony for Widener, Penn State Abington, and Villanova Universities. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present to you the commissioning class of 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem to be sung by Cadet Megan Barrett and remain standing for the invocation to be given by Pastor Chuck Kiefer. pray. Holy God, the protector of all who trust in you, we come today as a grateful nation, thankful for the freedom and liberty you've bestowed upon us, that it's granted by your providence and sustained by those willing to stand watch and when necessary to make great sacrifices. Grant to our young men and women today your assurance of your presence, the knowledge of your love and guidance of your spirit. As this new generation of leadership steps into the line, we pray that you grant them wisdom in times of turmoil, courage in times of difficulty, bravery in the heat of battle. May your mercy rule in all they do. Be with all who defend your truth and your peace that they may vanquish injustice and wrong. May they be peacemakers to a world in need of restoration and mercy, that they may seek your guidance so that they may be a force for good as they serve the poor and the oppressed. May their lives be of that of honor and integrity, and may they all seek justice in all that they do. May they serve with distinction and to be known as men and women of valor. Strengthen their resolve to do what is right, even when it is unpopular and inconvenient. May they represent our nation and defend what all Americans hold dear, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Grant them strength to live lives according to these ideals, the courage of their convictions, and to resolve and to endure whatever dangers threaten. Grant them protection in long life. Comfort all worried families, those loved ones who are in danger. Surround them with your love. Protect them with, with, with everything from all harm. Confirm what is founded on truth. Establish your love in our hearts that justice may abound on this earth, that all peoples rejoice in your peace. We ask this in the name of the Most High, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. 
It is now my honor to present Lieutenant Colonel John J. Peterson, the Freedom Battalion Commander and Professor of Military Science. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have a remarkable group assembled here today, so uh, please bear with me as I recognize a few people. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to President Harris, uh, Dr. Allen, and the executive team, uh, Dr. Poslusny, Dean of Arts and Sciences, the esteemed members of the Board of Trustees. I also thank Vicki Blevins and Carol DeBunda of the Pennsylvania State University Abingdon campus for joining us today. Vicki is the Director of Development and Alumni Affairs, and Carol is from the Career Development Office. Carol has a connection to Widener that is uh, up in our other location, and that is the name William Stevenson on the memorial plaque. Dennis Murphy, Vice President of Enrollment, is here from Newman University. Dennis helps our efforts on Newman's campus, and he's a relative of a recent Widener graduate, Lieutenant Audie Murphy. I'd also like to thank General Tolelli, our guest speaker, Brigadier General Hodges, and all the retired and currently serving military. Last but not least, to our distinguished guests, family and friends of the Freedom Battalion, welcome to the Widener University Commissioning Ceremony. At this time, I'd like to recognize a Widener student named Eric Schoenman, son of Mary Ann Schoenman from the Widener University Relations Office. Eric, could you please stand up? Thank you. Eric did not go through our ROTC program, but he was commissioned directly as a second lieutenant on the 3rd of February, 2009. Uh, this was through a specific health profession uh, program with the US Army. And he will be attending the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine beginning in August, and upon graduation, will serve the Army in the medical profession. Thank you. I want to especially thank Susan DeCrecio, the Freedom Battalion cadets and Widener staff that helped her schedule and organize this event. Well done, it's a first class ceremony. We're here today to confer Army officer commissions on the 15 outstanding men and women seated before you. 11 of them are Widener students, three of them are Villanova students, and one is a Penn State Abington student. Earlier this month, the Freedom Battalion commissioned three officers at our Westchester University campus. As you can see, the Freedom Battalion unites several institutions of higher education. And from my perspective, each school is different with unique strengths and expertise, but they all share a common goal to produce graduates with the knowledge, skills, and abilities to succeed. The goal is not just success for the individual, but to be a positive, productive member of our society. These American citizens are well on their way to accomplishing that for themselves and for our society. They're going to be teachers, police officers, doctors, nurses, and other professions. And of course, the reason we're here today is that all of them have chosen to serve our nation through service as an Army officer. They have volunteered to take extra classes and extra time to accomplish the training required to earn a commission. This is something not everyone can do. It requires physical stamina and mental toughness. So why in the world would they put themselves through the extra misery when it's not required? Well, that's kind of a tough question to articulate but the, the definition of the word commission has a few clues. Webster's Dictionary defines a commission as a formal written warrant granting the power to perform various acts or duties. It goes on to say, the authority to act for, in behalf of, or in place of another. These officers are commissioned today to act in the place of the American people in behalf of the president authorized by the United States Congress. The conferral of this authority requires acknowledgement on both sides. The President of the United States of America acknowledges a special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and ability of these individuals. And for their part, they will shortly execute the oath of office where they will swear to support and defend the Constitution and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. In a very direct way, these commissionees will be helping our national leaders improve the human condition in our country and around the world. As our Army engineer, some will likely be involved in nation building and infrastructure repair. As a nurse or a medical corps officer, some will be involved in the health of our soldiers and of others. And as military policemen, some will be focused on maintaining order, all in support of our nation's policies. These lieutenant bars represent responsibility, but they're also a license to learn. As an example, let me use a personal experience. I have three daughters, three teenage daughters. 
A couple of years ago, one of them, in a fit of frustration, uttered the classic teenage line, why do I have to learn algebra? I'm never going to use this again in my entire life. Well, with my undergraduate degree in chemistry and master's degree in operations research, of course, I know why you need algebra, but I didn't have an answer. I just didn't have an answer. About a week later, I figured it out. It's, it's not about algebra. It's not even about math. It's about problem solving. And you need to learn algebra because it teaches you logic in problem solving. <clears throat> uh, I thought of that a little too late for the particular daughter, but I've got a younger one that I might be able to apply it to. So. Uh, you have to take what you know to solve the problems that you don't know. And that's what algebra does, and that's what this program of ROTC has done for you. You've just learned military algebra. So take what you know and start working on what you don't know to solve those problems and be prepared to learn calculus. Uh, you have an excellent education from an outstanding university. You've received your military training from an elite group of officers, NCOs, and staff, and you have the love and support of your family. That is a great start. I couldn't think of a better start for you. Use the tools you have to learn your craft and build your Army strength. Develop your leadership skills and take care of our national treasure, which are the soldiers that you're going to lead. As parents, sometimes it's hard as your child moves from one stage to the next. Worry and concern are, are natural, but the base that you've given them and the education and the training that they have received and have yet to receive will, uh, will assure them success in whatever endeavor they, they want to accomplish. They are well positioned. I thank you for your support of the nation through your support of them. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the Officer Corps. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Brigadier General Frederick Hodges. Uh, I've known General Hodges since 2005. Uh, it just seems like I've known him forever because we were deployed together. And when you're deployed together for a year, working in close proximity for kind of long hours, you get to know somebody pretty well. Uh, after he agreed to speak at our commissioning, uh, we were going over some administrative details and he sent a note to my, my secretary, Susan, and he said, and I quote, Please feel free to send me any dirt you have on Lieutenant Peter, Colonel Peterson. If you don't have any, I'll provide some. <laughs> so you can see that he knows me well also. In, pre in preemption of whatever he may say in a couple minutes, I'll, I'll embarrass him a bit by highlighting a couple things uh, that may not be in his bio. I encourage you to read his bio, and uh, these will flesh out some of those points. Uh, he was the commander of the 1st Brigade, 101st Division. That brigade is also called the Bastogne Brigade. Surrounded by German forces, 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne refused to surrender, and the legendary one-word reply from General McAuliffe, nuts, was issued. Brigadier General Hodges commanded this brigade on the initial attack into Iraq in 2003. He also commanded the 3rd of the 187th Infantry. That unit is also called the Rakassans. The Rakassans have a long and storied history, and you may recognize some of these names associated with the Rakassans. General William Westmoreland commanded the Rakassans in the Korean War. General David Petraeus. General Norman Schwarzkopf. Colonel Michael Steele of Black Hawk Down fame. Captain Paul Buka, Medal of Honor for Vietnam. Corporal Lester Hammond, Medal of Honor. Corporal Rodolfo Hernandez, Medal of Honor. PFC Richard Wilson, Medal of Honor. Sergeant Major of the Army George Dunaway, who was the second Sergeant Major of the Army, and that is the highest ranking enlisted rank in the Army. And Sergeant Major Basil L. Plumley, who served with uh, the Rakassans, made a combat jump in the Korean War. He was Sergeant Major of the 7th Cavalry Regiment in Vietnam, where PMC's Jack Egan also served. Uh, Brigadier General Hodges hails from a part of the country that calls Georgia Yankees. Uh, he's a TV star. He was on the uh, History Channel providing background and expertise on some military history. He's met the Pope face to face. He enjoys a fine cigar. He can tell a good story or two and is a true warrior leader and gentleman. So please join me in welcoming Brigadier General Ben Hodges. <laughs> Uh, 
I have met the Pope, and uh, I didn't know John was going to surprise me with that uh, reminder. Uh, I'm Presbyterian, uh, but my wife is Catholic, um, so um, meeting the Pope, I'm now in with my mother-in-law forever, thankfully. <laughs> Uh, the way I met him uh, was uh, Pope John Paul. Uh, the fall of 1995, I was serving in Shape, Belgium, uh, working for General George Jowan, who was Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. And if you remember when U.S. and NATO forces went into Bosnia in December of 95, well, the Pope was very concerned, and he had asked General Jowan to uh, come see him so he could impress on him how important it was that NATO be successful in stopping the violence in Bosnia. Uh, General Jowan, by the way, is from Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and... Uh, uh, very proud of his Pennsylvania heritage. So we go to the Vatican, uh, and General Jowan is having the audience with the Pope, and I'm sitting out in the lobby with uh, Mrs. Jowan and uh, an Italian officer who was our escort uh, who worked with us at Shape Belgium. And while we were sitting around waiting, only half jokingly, I turned to uh, Maurizio. I said, Hey, I'm, I'm a little uneasy, a little worried being in here. And he goes, Why is that? And I said, Well, you know, I'm Presbyterian. I don't know if I should really be in here. I, I was kind of joking. But when he reacted with alarm, like, holy smoke, I didn't know you were not a Catholic. Um, <laughs> then, then I did get concerned. And uh, Maurizio walks away and then comes back with who I, I, I would assume was a cardinal. He had the, the black smock with the red belt and the, the red cap. He looked pretty senior. And he comes over to me and he says, this is like something right out of the movies. He goes, I understand you are concerned. I go, yes, sir, I am. I, he goes, why? I said, because I'm Presbyterian. He goes, only God will know. <laughs> so after that, kind of broke the ice, and uh, actually, then I, the Pope did come out, and uh, and he started cracking on me. He goes, he asked me if I was from Italy, and uh, General Jowan laughs. He goes, No, Your Excellency, the Major Hodges is from the southern part of our country. <laughs> I thought maybe you were from southern Italy. So the Pope is is killing me here, um, and the Pope also has a coin. You know, in the military, it's a tradition to have coins. I I have a Pope coin, uh, the only one in my family. And, uh, but I've never had the opportunity to challenge him. Um, didn't have the chance to, to get a beer from the Pope. <laughs> I am proud of that, so thanks for reminding me. Uh, I do want to thank uh, John Pearson. I'm very proud of the year that we spent together uh, in Baghdad. Uh, his work ethic, his moral compass is perfectly straight. His sense of humor and his love of soldiers makes him a perfect guy to uh, run a great ROTC program. So parents, uh, your sons and daughters have been in great hands, and for the next two classes at least, I hope, I will continue to get great leadership and mentoring and a uh, great role model. So I'm, I'm very proud of you, John. Uh, also, coming up here, I got to meet, um, run into old Master Sergeant Klinger. Uh, Sergeant Klinger, the new uh, Master Sergeant here, joining the team. Uh, we served together in the 101st. Uh, so again, parents, knowing you got top quality non-commissioned officers that are coming in, uh, to be part of the cadre to help uh, help these cadets learn what to expect from great non-commissioned officers and what their role as an officer will be, you've got exactly the right guy. Uh, Colonel Frank Hancock in the back, a legendary figure from the 101st. Uh, when I was a captain, uh, I had heard all about uh, Colonel Hancock, and so to run into him again this morning uh, is, a, is a real real privilege, sir. I'm glad you're here. And then finally, I saw another. You know, I, I love the 101st. I've uh, been there four times. I love that patch. Whenever I see that Screaming Eagle patch, I go right to it, and I saw a young sergeant back there, Sergeant Ernie, um, who's here with his brother and his mom, and of course he's here to support uh, one of today's commissionees, and uh, had that served in you know, Strike Brigade, Second Brigade of the 101st. Great young man. And so, one of the points I'd I'd like to leave you with today, or leave with you today, is um, you know we've been at war for almost eight years. Really, if you think about it, since the 80s, when the first terrorist attack hit the Marine barracks in Beirut, and, and all the other attacks that have happened against the coal and and so on. The war started before 9-11, but really we talk about the country being at war. It's been almost eight years now, and the fact that people like Sergeant Ernie back there and, and the, these young cadets here, about to be lieutenants, have been watching that for eight years uh, with you, and they still chose to step forward to serve their country, uh, I think says an awful lot about them and also about the home and the family that they come from. I really want to say thanks also to the administration, sir, um, from all the, all the schools that are here, uh, for your support for ROTC. Um, I went to the military academy. I could have never survived at a real school, I suspect. But um, the support that the universities provide for ROTC says an awful lot about how you value service to the nation. 
regardless of what somebody may think about a particular policy or whether or not the war is just, the fact is that you support Reserve Officer Training Corps uh, programs on, on your campus, you are communicating to the community and to the young people that service to the nation is something that's very, very important. And we want the best possible quality people and, and for them to have the best possible preparation for that service. So thank you for the way that you support that. And obviously this place has done that for a very long time. Pennsylvania uh, has been providing soldiers uh, and support for the country since before the country was born. Obviously the Army was formed in 1775 our 234th birthday coming up here in June uh, next month. Pennsylvania has been a part of that uh, from the very beginning. And so there are a lot, thousands of soldiers today in the Army that are from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and Maryland, and they need great officers. And so schools like Widener and Villanova and Penn State Abington are providing those. So thank you very much. I'd like to say a few words specifically to the cadets who in a few minutes are going to become second lieutenants. I don't expect you to remember much of what I'll say today. I can't even remember who my, who my speaker was when I was commissioned, but there are about three points that I would like for you to, that I'm going to try and uh, reinforce, and I suspect these are things you've been hearing for the last four years, um, and I want to reinforce those today. They're about the oath that you're going to take. They're about the importance of you always accomplishing your mission, whatever that is, and it's going to be about you taking care of your soldiers and their families. The first is the oath. And when, we, when they do take the oath, I'd like for all of you to listen to it. The words, it's very simple, it's very profound. The oath you're about to take is to the Constitution of the United States. It's not to the President, it's not to the Secretary of Defense, it's not to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, it's to the Constitution of the United States. That carries with it an awesome duty and responsibility that you have to your fellow citizens. This oath reinforces the concept of civilian leadership the leaders of our country who are elected by the American people over the armed forces of our nation. It is your duty to carry out their lawful orders. This oath also carries with it the expectation of you that you will serve with honor and that your standard of integrity is perfection. It means that you are expected to be a good steward of resources and that you'll treat all people with dignity and respect. In every single negative case that has come out of Iraq or Afghanistan, there was an officer somewhere in the chain who failed to live up to their oath or who chose to ignore it. It's your duty to ensure that you and your fellow officers always live up to that oath. Your soldiers will expect it. The second point is about mission. <clears throat> mission is a broad term, but I'm talking about anything, any task that you are given, whether it's a tactical mission or something that happens back in garrison. At the end of the day, this is what, most, this is what matters the most. That is why the President of the United States is giving you this commission to accomplish the task that he sets before you. I can assure you, you will never have all the resources that you need. You'll always wish you had more time, you'll always wish you had more soldiers, and you will always wish you had better, more clear information. These shortfalls won't be because your commanders didn't care or didn't try to get it for you. It's just that you're going to encounter a lot of really challenging, tough problems and situations and you'll be expected to solve them no matter how hard they are, no matter, no matter how under-resourced you may be. And you know what? You will solve them. The instincts and adaptive skills you have now in which you and your soldiers will sharpen and develop in the coming months and years will enable you to accomplish your mission. Let, but let there be no doubt, your commander and your country will always expect that you will accomplish your mission. Finally, number three, responsibility for your soldiers and their families. As the officer, you are responsible for ensuring your soldiers are well trained, that they have the best possible equipment, and that they are getting their pay, their health care, and all their educational benefits. It is also your responsibility to ensure the well-being of the families of those married soldiers, and about half of your soldiers will be married. Now let me tell you about those soldiers that you're about to get. Three short stories, but I think they're illustrative of the kind of soldiers that are out in our ranks. First soldier, this is uh, March, excuse me, April of uh, 2003. We're in the outskirts of the city of Najaf. Uh, we have press that is embedded with us. They're they all around us actually, um, watching as the soldiers go into this large city, about 600,000 Shia uh, live in the city of Najaf. Most of the fighting has kind of died down there. And 
uh, one of the soldiers has done something he wasn't supposed to do. He, he purchased some food from the local economy. It was a, actually a big bag of cookies. Uh, I can't hardly get too mad at him for breaking down there. So he's sitting there eating this big giant cookie. And there was a French photographer that was with the unit that was sitting there watching him. Now, you, many of you will recall, at the start of the war, France was not real popular. I mean, there was a lot of you know, jokes on TV and, and so on, and a lot of criticism of the French. So this photographer um, asked the soldier, said, hey, says, that cookie looks pretty good. And the soldier's sitting there eating, he goes, it is. He says, could I have one? And the soldier looks at the photographer and says, aren't you French? And he goes, well, yes, I am. And so the soldier goes, nope. And so the, the photographer then says, well, actually, I'm only half French. My, my mother is Swiss. So the soldier takes a cookie, breaks it in half, and gives him half a cookie. <laughs> Next great soldier is a medic. And some of you may have even seen this video. The video was taken by uh, an enemy sniper who had his position in the back of a van down an alley. And so you can hear, you can hear this uh, enemy sniper talking. He's praying, actually, as he's getting ready to pull the trigger. And you can see probably about 40, 30 or 40 meters away as an American soldier has his body armor on, a medic standing next to his vehicle. The sniper fires, hits a soldier right in the chest, the soldier falls to the ground, and then all of a sudden he, he jumps back up into the picture, and he is really mad. And he's looking around trying to find out who just shot him. And so now all of a sudden the, the sniper, whose voice is audible on the camera, the, the pace picks up, he starts getting all excited, and the vehicle starts driving away. This medic is able to chase down the van, the getaway vehicle, if you will. They shoot the driver, they actually wound the driver and the sniper, and then the medic treats the guy that just shot him and saves him. Now, I'm not going to kid you, that medic probably had a bruise that lasted about a month right on his sternum, but his body armor saved him, obviously saved him from the round. But when you see his face when the kid jumps back up, like, who the heck just shot me, and then chases him down, that's the kind of soldier you got out there waiting on you. The third one, National Guard engineer, driving a bulldozer, um, again outside this, in the Tigris River Valley south of Mosul, a huge sulfur plant, thousands and thousands of uh, tons of sulfur sitting on the ground that had been milled out of the, uh, out of the oil in the area there, and it caught on fire. Now, I was not a chemistry major, John, so I didn't realize that you cannot put sulfur fire out with water. So for two days, I'm arguing with my engineer captain, telling him we got to get more water to put the sulfur fire out. Finally, after two days, we haven't made a dent in the fire, and he says, sir, I've been telling you, you got to suffocate it, you got to put dirt on it. So now I've got engineers uh, pushing dirt onto this, what looks like the beginning of time, this sulfur is bubbling, uh, it, it's liquid now, and it's probably close to 1,000 degrees. And this is in July of 03, so on a good day, it's about 105 degrees anyway. So we've got soldiers driving, in, driving bulldozers, pushing dirt up. So you've got to drive this bulldozer up to the edge of a pit of bubbling, burning sulfur. And it is really hot, and of course, you can imagine the fumes. So all the soldiers that are doing this are having to wear their protective masks, their gas masks. And I'm sitting there. This has been going on now for about five or six days. And uh, I am really frustrated. And frankly, I'm starting to get a little bit discouraged. And I see this sergeant up there. And he's working this big bulldozer on me right to the edge. And then he'd back off and get more dirt. And he sees me, and he looks over, and he rips off his mask. And he yells out, sir, I think we're winning. I think we're going to get it done. And he pulls his mask back down and, and keeps on driving. And I got so much strength and energy from the way that young sergeant, how he was doing his job and the confidence he had that, you know, that, that's what helped me get through. You know, we had to keep focused and keep doing this. I don't want to sugarcoat that, but I'm, that's part of what you're about to enter. You're going to join, whether it's an artillery unit, an engineering unit, a medical unit, you're going to be surrounded by people who will depend on each other. And they will, they will watch you, even though you'll be, you may be the youngest, newest person in the unit, you are their officer. And they're going to watch you, and they're going to draw strength from your example. They don't expect you to know everything, but they expect you to be there. And they're going to draw strength from that, and you will, in turn, draw strength from them. So when we say take care of the troops, what does that really mean? You'll have great non-commissioned officers working for you who have been through everything that that private could possibly go through. Use them. Trust your instincts that your parents gave to you. 
and really, really care about those soldiers, even the ones who might be a little bit harder to love sometimes. I expect you to set an example. Your, your soldiers will expect you to be, have perfect integrity. Set an example of how you treat civilians, detainees. And finally, a soldier will forgive his officer of everything except cowardice. So no matter what, they will expect you to lead from the front. And now those three words you've been waiting on, and in conclusion, <laughs> let me say how proud I'm of you and your parents. The fact that you were able to get into a prestigious school and graduate indicated that you probably had lots of other options. You chose to join the ROTC and become an Army officer. You did this even though our country has been at war for almost eight years, about the time you were just starting high school. For eight years, you and your parents have watched this war, and you have chosen to step forward to serve your country as an Army officer, knowing in all likelihood you may very well deploy. This says so much about you and your parents and how much you care about this nation. I look at you and I'm encouraged and inspired. There are soldiers out there now who are hungry for your leadership. I can't wait to see you out there. You're going to be terrific. Army Strong. Thank you, sir. Um, as, as I mentioned, I, I know that he enjoys a, a fine cigar, so I got him a Kevlar cigar case that he can take when he goes back to the desert or wherever he may go. So. Thank you very Thank much, John. The cadets will now take the oath of office administered by a military officer, active or retired. A few have selected a family member or close friend to do the honors. The oath is printed on the back of your program, so feel free uh, to take a look at that while you do the oath, and also to come forward for photographs if you would like. Navy Lieutenant Frank Swanger, a family friend, will now administer the oath of office to Cadet Franklin G. Guth. Lieutenant Colonel Retired Thomas C. Kane will now administer the oath of office to his son, Brendan M. Kane. Colonel retired Frank R. Hancock, a mentor and friend, will now administer the oath of office to Cadet Sarah M. Painter.
child that I share your faith and allegiance, and allegiance to the same. To the same. That I take this obligation. That I take this obligation freely. Freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose. Or purpose. Of it. Of it. And that I will well. And that and I will well. Faithfully discharge. And faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Upon which. Upon which. I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Women's Medical Specialty Corps Second Lieutenant Suzanne Reynolds Lopez will now administer the oath of office to her granddaughter, Caroline H. Smith. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now administer the oath of office to the rest of today's commissioning cadets. Please take your seats. Each newly commissioned officer now will now be called forward individually for the traditional pinning on of the gold bars representing their new rank of second lieutenant, for the first salute with a non-commissioned officer, and to receive their commissioning certificate from the professor of military science. Those of you who have been invited to assist with the pinning on of rank should come forward when your commissionee's name is read. Again, feel free to take photographs at any time. One tradition associated with the hand salute has withstood the test of time. The tradition is a newly appointed officer giving a silver dollar to the first enlisted person to salute him after he receives his commission. The exact origin of this custom is arguable. Researchers suggest that it came from the British regiments stationed in colonial America. They brought with them a number of customs and traditions that were retained by the newly formed American units. For example, 
Newly commissioned British officers were assigned an enlisted soldier to train them, teach them the regiment's history and traditions, and ensure that the officer's kit, dress and field uniforms, and personal equipment were serviceable at all times. Grateful lieutenants often showed their heartfelt gratitude by informally compensating the enlisted man with a small amount of money. This custom continued to grow within the British military and newly, form newly formed American units. American second lieutenants in, 1870, in 1816 received a monthly base pay of $25, a $3 ration allowance, and $1 for an enlisted advisor. This advisor's pay was later discontinued, but the responsibility for teaching the newly commissioned officers continued. The present day tradition is thought to have its roots in this relationship. The silver dollar is traditionally the only coin given in exchange for the first salute. The coin represents more than a dollar in currency. To every new officer, it has special significance. It represents the symbolic receipt of respect due a newly earned rank and position. Today's commissionees will have have personally selected the non-commissioned officers who will share in the honor of this silver dollar salute. Our first commissioned officer is Second Lieutenant Keith M. Bright. Lieutenant Bright is graduating from Widener University with a degree in history and will enter the Army as an infantry officer. He is a distinguished, I'm sorry, he's a graduate of the U.S. Army Airborne School. During the school year, he served as Command Sergeant Major and Cadet Battalion Commander. On 7 March, 2010, he will enter active duty for the Basic Officer Leader Course, Bullock, Phases 2 and 3 training at Fort Benning, Georgia. His follow-on assignment is at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Lieutenant Bright will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Tim and Kelly Bright. Lieutenant Bright will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Bright. <laughs> Second Lieutenant James M. Doherty. Lieutenant Doherty is graduating from Villanova University with a degree in finance. He will enter the Virginia Army National Guard as a Chemical Corps officer. During the school year, he has served as the Bravo Company First Sergeant and Cadet Battalion Intelligence Officer. His future unit of assignment is with the 1st Battalion, 111th Field Artillery Regiment in Hampton, Virginia. Lieutenant Doherty will have his rank pinned on by his father, James Doherty. Lieutenant Doherty will have his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Doherty. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Miles W. Durkin. Lieutenant Durkin is graduating from Villanova University with a degree in electrical engineering and will enter the Army as an infantry officer. He is an ROTC Distinguished Military Graduate and the battalion recipient of the George C. Marshall Leadership Award. 
He has also completed U.S. Army Airborne School and the Sapper Leaders Course. During the school year, he served as the Cadet Battalion Commander and Operations Officer. On 7 March 2010, he will enter active duty for the Basic Officer Leader Course, Bolick Phases 2 and 3 training at Fort Benning, Georgia. His follow-on assignment will be with the 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Lieutenant Durkin will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Robert and Catherine Durkin. Lieutenant Durkin will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Grease. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Durkin. Second Lieutenant Robert F. Gold. Lieutenant Gold is graduating from Widener University with a degree in business management and will enter the Army as an engineer officer. During his senior year, he served as the Alpha Company First Sergeant and First Sergeant Advisor. On 6 January 2010, he will enter active duty and report to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for Bullock Phase 2 training, followed by Phase 3 at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. His first duty assignment will be with the 5th Brigade, 2nd Infantry Division, Fort Lewis, Washington. Lieutenant Gold will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Robert and Jamie Gold. Lieutenant Gold will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Gold. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Franklin G. Guth. Lieutenant Guth is graduating from Widener University with a degree in accounting and will enter the Army as a field artillery officer. He is a graduate of the U.S. Army Airborne School. During his senior year, he served as Alpha Company Executive Officer and Platoon Sergeant Advisor. On 20, 28 October 2009, he will enter active duty and report to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for Bullock Phase 2 and 3 training. His first duty assignment will be with the 18th Airborne Corps at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Lieutenant Guth will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Franklin and Georgette Guth. Lieutenant Guth will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Guth. Second Lieutenant Tyler D. Harvey. Right, Lieutenant Harvey is graduating from Widener University with a degree in criminal justice and will enter the Army as a Transportation Corps officer. During his senior year, he served as the Cadet Battalion Logistics Officer. On 2 July 2009, he will enter active duty and report for Bullock Phase 2 training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, followed by Phase 3 at Fort Eustis, Virginia. His first duty assignment will be with the 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division, Fort Drum, New York. <clears throat> Lieutenant Harvey will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Dr. Dave and Kim Harvey. <laughs> Lieutenant Harvey will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese.
Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present the commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Harvey. Second Lieutenant Christopher S. Housel. Lieutenant Housel is graduating from Widener University with a degree in criminal justice and sociology. He is an ROTC distinguished military graduate, a combat veteran, and has completed as a cadet the U.S. Army Airborne School and Air Assault Schools. During his senior year, he served as the Cadet Battalion Operations Officer and Executive Officer. On 3 June 2009, he will enter active duty and report to Fort Lewis, Washington to support Cadet Command's Leadership Development and Assessment course, followed by Bullock Phase II training at Fort Benning, Georgia, then Bullock III Phase uh, training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. His first duty assignment will be with the 148th Military Police Section, Fort Carson, Colorado. Lieutenant Housel will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Harry and Christine Housel. Lieutenant Housel will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Housing. Second Lieutenant Megan N. Housel. Lieutenant Housel is graduating from Widener University with a degree in Computer Information Systems. She will enter the Army as a Quartermaster Corps Officer. She is a graduate of the U.S. Army Airborne School. During the school year, she served as the Alpha Company Commander and Company Commander Advisor. On 15 June 2009, she will enter active duty and report to Fort Knox, Kentucky in support of Cadet Command's Leaders Training Course, followed by Bullock Phase II training at Fort Benning, Georgia, and Phase III training at Fort Lee, Virginia. Her first duty assignment will be with the 2nd Brigade 4th Infantry Division, Fort Carson, Colorado. Lieutenant Housel will have her rank pinned on by her parents, Mark and Becky Sands. Lieutenant Housel will now receive her first salute from Sergeant First Class David T. Ressler. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present her commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Housel. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Brendan M. Kane. Lieutenant Kane is graduating from Villanova University with a degree in history. He will enter the Army as an Engineer Corps officer. He is an ROTC Distinguished Military graduate. During the school year, he served as the Bravo Company Commander and Company Commander Advisor. On 8 January 2010, he will enter active duty and report for Bullock Phase II training at Fort Benning, Georgia, followed by Phase III training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. His first duty assignment will be with the 19th Engineer Battalion, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Lieutenant Kane will have his rank pinned on by his father, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Thomas G. Kane. And, and mother.
<laughs> Lieutenant Kane will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Creese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant King. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Alexander C. Lamb. Lieutenant Lamb is graduating from Widener University with a degree in sociology. He will enter the Army as a military police corps officer. During the school year, he served as the cadet battalion adjutant and command sergeant major. On 2 June 2009, he will enter active duty and report to Fort Lewis, Washington to support Cadet Command's leadership development and assessment course, followed by Bullock Phase II training at Fort Benning, Georgia, and Bullock III training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. His first duty assignment will be with the 4th Combat Support Brigade at Fort Leonard Wood. Lieutenant Lamb will have his rank pinned on by his parents, Eric and Elizabeth Lamb. Lieutenant Lamb will now have his first salute from Master Sergeant James Creese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Lamb. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Sarah M. Painter. Lieutenant Painter is graduating from Widener University with a degree in criminal justice. She will enter the Pennsylvania Army National Guard as a Transportation Corps officer. During the school year, she served as the Cadet Battalion Civil Affairs Officer and Adjutant. Her future unit of assignment is with the 2nd Battalion, 104th Aviation Brigade, Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Painter will have her rank pinned on by her father, Charles Painter, and her grandmother, Ravina Swope. Lieutenant Painter will have her first salute from Sergeant Timothy Ernie. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present her certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> Second Lieutenant Michael A. Qualia. Lieutenant Qualia is graduating from Penn State University, Abington, with a degree in history. He will enter the Pennsylvania Army National Guard as a field artillery officer. During the school year, he served as the Charlie Company commander and Com company Commander Advisor. His future unit of assignment is with the 1st Battalion, 109th Infantry Regiment in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Qualia will have his rank pinned on by his father, Louis Qualia, and... <laughs> Lieutenant Qualia will now receive his first salute from Sergeant Jordan Manis. Okay, Master Sergeant James Creese. Sir, lead the way. Out. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Qualia.
Second Lieutenant Caroline H. Smith. Lieutenant Smith is graduating from Widener University with a degree in nursing. She will enter the Army as a Nurse Corps officer. During the school year, she served as the Cadet Battalion Intelligence Officer and Civil Affairs Officer. She will enter active duty for training at Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, followed by an assignment at Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany. Lieutenant Smith will have her rank pinned on by her parents, Jerry and Judy Smith. Lieutenant Smith will now receive her first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present her commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Smith. Second Lieutenant Edmund H. Waldeyer. Lieutenant Waldeyer is graduating from Widener University with a degree in government and politics and a minor in criminal justice. He will enter the Pennsylvania Army National Guard as an infantry officer. During the school year, he served as the Cadet Battalion Executive Officer. His future unit of assignment is with Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 111th Infantry, 56th Strike Brigade in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Lieutenant Waldeyer will have his rank pinned on by his mother, Donna Waldeyer. Lieutenant Waldeyer will receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Well. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Waldeyer. Second Lieutenant Adam W. Wiley. Lieutenant Wiley is graduating from Widener University with a degree in criminal justice. He will enter the Army as an infantry officer. During the school year, he served as an assistant cadet battalion staff officer. On 7 March 2010, he will enter active duty for the basic officer leader course phases two and three at Fort Benning, Georgia. His follow-on assignment is with the 4th Infantry Division, Fort Carson, Colorado. Lieutenant Wiley will have his rank pinned on by his mother and stepfather, Denise and Michael, Catalano. Lieutenant Wiley will now receive his first salute from Master Sergeant James Kreese. Lieutenant Colonel Peterson will now present his commissioning certificate. Congratulations, Lieutenant Wiley. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the posting of the orders. Attention to orders. The President of the United States has reposed special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of Keith M. Bright, James M. Doherty, Miles W. Durkin, Robert F. Gold, Franklin G. Guth, Tyler D. Harvey, Christopher S. Housel, Megan N. Housel, Brendan M. Kane, Alexander C. Lamb, Sarah M. Painter, 
Michael A. Qualia, Caroline H. Smith, Edmund Waldire, and Adam W. Wiley. They are therefore appointed to the grade of Second Lieutenant in the United States Army, effective 14 May 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, the newly commissioned class of 2009. Please be seated. Second Lieutenant Miles Durkin will now be presented with the Widener Alumni, Alumni Sabre. The Sabre is awarded to the newly commissioned Lieutenant in the Freedom Battalion who has demonstrated the highest attributes of scholastic achievement, leadership excellence, and overall superior performance. Lieutenant Durkin will receive the Sabre from Mr. David McNulty, Esquire, Pennsylvania Military College, class of 1963. Lieutenant Durkin, could you please uh, step back here and uh, relax a little bit? We'll have a little informal discussion just between the two of us with some people overhearing us. I want you to know that it, was, it is my honor and privilege to be asked to participate in today's service. It's deeply moving and sentimental to me, for this is the 46th anniversary of my graduation from this institution, which was then known as Pennsylvania Military College, the second oldest military college in the nation. It's also the 46th anniversary of my commissioning as a young second lieutenant on the parade field behind Old Main. I come to you as a voice from the past, bringing you a message of insight and truth for your future. It's the same message that we received as incoming freshman cadets in 1959. The timeless message is this, that character counts. It counted then, and it counts today more than ever. Dr. Harris's predecessor from generations past, Colonel Hyatt, coined an epigram of truth for all young cadets at this institution. It is part of the wisdom literature of PMC and Widener and has stood the test of time and the devolution of our mores. His proverb was as follows. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. In the opening lines of our PMC alma mater, Beneath the dome of PMC, the cadets in gray march by, the banners of our loyalty held ever bright and high. Though weary years have called us forth from home to foreign sod, the truths you taught shall hold us fast, the country and to God. Weary years have indeed called me and my classmates from home to hostile foreign sod. And yes, the truths we were taught under the dome, as symbolized by the saber, have indeed held us fast to country and to God. Two of my classmates paid the ultimate price for the preservation of these truths by their combat service in Vietnam. On the plaque in front of the flagpole, you'll find their names. John Lance Gagan, affectionately known as Jack. William J. Stevenson affectionately known as Buddy. Carol, his widow, is here today. My friend Jack was the top cadet and president of our class. He was the brigade commander. He was a man of character and integrity, one of the most distinguished military students in the entire nation in 1963. <coughs> like you, Jack was the recipient of this saber 46 years ago. In an historic event behind Old Main, Retired President and former five-star general Dwight David Eisenhower received, reviewed the Pennsylvania Military College Corps of Cadets prior to our commissioning. In return, Jack Gagan presented another ceremonial saber to President Eisenhower, and we, the Corps of Cadets, were saluted and blessed by the supreme allied commander of World War II and President of the United States. Today, as a member of the Freedom Battalion, 
you, all of you, are the continuing heir and benefactor of that salute and blessing by General Eisenhower. By my presentation of this saber, I link you back in time to that historic event. Two years later, Jack would be killed in Vietnam in the Battle of Adrang Valley, but a couple of months later. Jack's heroic story is portrayed in the Mel Gibson movie, We Were Soldiers. Jack, death and buddies like their life was virtuous and noble. Jack received the silver star for gallantry in action and trying to save the life of one of his wounded troopers. It is with sacred honor and cherished memory of Jack and buddy from my class, Captain Nathan Rowdenbush, class of 05, killed in Iraq. And on behalf of all the members living and deceased of the long gray line of PMC and Freedom Battalion cadets, that this saber is passed on to you. There's one caveat, however. The saber comes heavy with responsibility and symbolism. The good news is that it's lightened by the heartfelt prayers of your loved ones and all the members of the cadet corps who have passed before you. Receiving this saber is very much like unto the anointing of a knight. On behalf of all of your fellow officers, you are being sanctified and set apart for a noble and decent purpose. General Eisenhower told us, history does not long entrust the care of freedom to the weak or the timid. In saving Private Ryan, Captain John Miller whispered in the ear of James Ryan, James, earn it, earn it. In Flanders Field in World War I, Dr. John McRae passed the torch to a new generation saying, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. On behalf of all those who have gone before, Jack, Buddy, Nathan, and all those yet to be commissioned, I charge you to earn it and not break faith with us. I charge you to be a person of firm character, a lieutenant of unshakable ethic, an officer of unmatched integrity. George Washington said, when we assumed the soldier, we did not lay aside the citizen. You are to be a leader beyond reproach, a servant of inexhaustible patience and grace, a patriot aglow with the zeal and passion for your country and constitution, and a model citizen and an alumnus of the highest virtue and nobility. May God bless you, Lieutenant Durkin, and keep you in his care. Lieutenant Durkin will now prepare to sheath the Corps Sabre. This event is a long-standing tradition carried on from the days of the Pennsylvania Military College when the cadet first captain would sheath the Sabre to signal the end of the academic year. Ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the playing of the Army song. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we commend to your gracious care these young men and women. Bless our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day by your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils that beset them and help them to remember that none can pluck your, them out of your hand for all who trust in you. Bless them now and may God bless America. Amen.
the commissionees will now file forward to be congratulated by President Harris, Provost Allen, Brigadier General Hodges, Lieutenant Colonel Peterson, and Master Sergeant Kreese. On behalf of Lieutenant Colonel Peterson and the entire Freedom Battalion, thank you for joining us today in this very special celebration. A reception will be held in the University Center web room at this time, and the web room is located down the hall to my left. Thank you.